So now as we continue our look through digestion, we're going to now be specifically focusing on the human digestive system. And that's what we'll entitle the next flowchart. Human digestive system. So this is going to be a broad overview of our digestive system. And from this point forward, we're going to then look at the pathway of digestion. This is summarized in figure 41.9. Shows you a good overview of the compartments, the organs, the parts that are associated with our digestive systems. So, to begin, we'll start with a basic introduction to human digestive systems. Now, first of all, we possess a complete digestive system. A good way to state that is that we have an alimentary canal. Something with very specialized compartments with specific functions in food processing. So, that's our basic starting point. We all have an alimentary canal. But we can add a little bit more complexity to our digestive systems via the accessory organs that are also there. And specifically, they will be found in the form of accessory glands. There will be many accessory glands throughout our digestive system. So if you remember from the endocrine lectures, glands are things that are going to secrete things. But there's a bit of a difference in the human digestive system as compared to the endocrine glands that we're so used to. The accessory glands of the digestive system are all going to be, the ones that we need to know at least, are going to be exocrine in function. Okay? Key is exocrine. They are not endocrine glands. They are exocrine glands. This means that these digestive accessory glands will secrete, and the technical term here is juices, secrete digestive juices through ducts. Okay? It must be through ducts. If it's not through ducts and it's released into the bloodstream, then we obviously have an endocrine gland. But right now we're directly utilizing ducts to secrete certain juices exocrinely. Okay? And that's always going to be something you should associate with the digestive system. Lots of exocrine secretions, exocrine gland secretions. Some of these will include, let's say, um, there will be three pairs of salivary glands, three pairs of salivary glands. Um, there will also be uh, many different exocrine glands of the pancreas. These are all compartments, right, of the entire digestive system. The pancreas will possess some, the liver will possess some, and so will the gallbladder. We'll get to each of these as we go through the pathway of digestion. So again, all of these are going to secrete endocrine or exocrine juices through ducts, okay? There's going to be the duct usage here. Make sure that's very, very clear. It's not endocrine in any way. In addition to our elementary canal, our accessory glands, there's going to be one mechanism that is seen throughout digestion. And that is the fact that in human digestion, we are going to be constantly utilizing a process known as peristalsis. So peristalsis is a term we've mentioned before, but in the context of human digestion, what we need to understand is the following. This is when we utilize smooth muscle. And we all know that smooth muscle is involuntary. And that smooth muscle will have what are termed alternating waves of contraction. So alternating waves of contractions slash relaxations. So there's going to be a contraction followed by a relaxation. Contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. All not controlled by you, all involuntarily controlled by smooth muscle and this is going to be seen throughout, all throughout the digestive tract, DT for digestive tract. So the reason why we utilize peristalsis is the following. We have to get food from the beginning of the tube to the end of the tube. That's not just going to happen via gravity. There actually needs to be some sort of mechanical force that causes food to go down. But remember, you never need to tell your body, hey, bring food from this point of the digestive system to the next point of the digestive system. It just happens on its own. It's involuntary. Therefore, these waves of contractions and relaxations, this is just a way to push food down this tube to the correct next compartment, all involuntarily via smooth muscle. This is broadly just termed peristalsis. So the human digestive system will utilize peristalsis to push food 
throughout this system. We're going to be seeing this term come up again as we go through the pathway a little bit later. In addition, another structure, not function here, this is a function, but a structure that's seen throughout the digestive tract are sphincters. Sphincters are also going to be seen throughout, from beginning to end, throughout the digestive tract. It's important to remember each of the sphincters that are going to be mentioned in the lecture. I'll try to make sure I highlight them as obviously as possible. So you need to know the sphincters that are seen throughout the digestive tract. This is because sphincters are going to be, in terms of their structure, they're ring-like valves. Okay? They're ring-like muscular valves. And much like the rest of the digestive system, in terms of the muscle makeup, this is going to be smooth muscle as well. So sphincters will involuntarily act as valves. If you understand what a valve is, a valve is simply something that opens and closes. Remember, there are compartments within the digestive system, meaning that there will be an opening to the compartment and a closing to that compartment. In order to mediate the traveling from compartment A to compartment B, there will always be a valve, a sphincter, a muscular structure that either opens or closes depending on what needs to be done. So we can broadly state that sphincters therefore are going to be regulators in the sense that they regulate the passage of material and material in this situation would obviously be food that's digested from one compartment, one organ, if you want to think of it like that, one compartment of this very compartmentalized system to another. So whenever you want to go from one point of the digestive system to the next point, um, throughout that pathway you're always going to be following or going through a sphincter that has to open and then subsequently close. Because you don't want all the sphincters to be open. That would just allow food to just go through you without any sort of digestive breakdown. You need to have the specific events occur at the specific times they need to, and then once it's ready, once that food is ready to go to the next compartment, then you'll have the sphincter open and allow that food to go to the next compartment to begin or to start the next step in digestion. So these are common things seen throughout human digestion. Be very aware of them because they're going to be seen and showing up over and over as we go through the actual pathway of digestion. But before we get into the pathway of digestion, we actually have to look at what happens before ingestion. So if you remember, ingestion was the first step of food processing. But before ingestion even begins, your digestive system actually starts working. How is this possible? What we can state is the following. Before ingestion, and we've all experienced this, the digestive system is going to already be triggered. Okay, it's going to already be triggered. So the digestive system is already triggered. And how is this going to happen? This is going to happen involuntarily as well. This is through the nervous system. The nervous system is going to, before you even put any food in your mouth, ingest anything, it initiates what are known as salivary secretions. This is a very fancy way of saying something that we have all experienced before. Salivary secretions prior to ingestion, prior to putting any food within that mouth, this is just the idea of mouth watering. We have all experienced this before, and it's a very, very nervous system controlled process. Think of it like this. Your senses are going to be very much involved in this before ingestion mouth watering process. Because what's going to happen is you're going to, let's say, utilize olfaction. That's smelling, right? That's a sense. And that sense has to afferently go to the brain. The brain will integrate that sense, that smell, and will say, oh, this smells appetizing. This smells good. And then the brain, the nervous system, will efferently send a message to the effector here. Remember, effectors can be muscles and glands. Look what we got. We have glands, like salivary glands, that will be triggered, that will have an effect as a result of this efferent message sent from the brain to those salivary glands saying, hey, prepare for a possible meal. Start the mouth-watering process. Now, the purpose of this mouth watering will be highlighted when we actually look at the beginning of digestion in the next couple of flowcharts. 
But just know that before even you begin eating anything, and we've experienced this before, there's a mouth watering that occurred. This is a purposeful reaction by the body to some sort of afferent message that was then integrated and efferently sent as a response to the sense of, let's say, maybe smelling something that uh, smells really good, possibly that's going to taste really good as well. So that's our overview of human digestion and the beginning of this process. In the next couple of flowcharts, we're going to now be looking at the entire pathway from beginning to end of digestion.